ready? Good afternoon, I hope you're not too sleepy. I promise if you make it through this, there will be coffee. Um, so my name is Laura, I'm from Chicago. I traveled quite a long way to get here, um, but it is a wonderful, lovely city. I've never been here before, so I'm enjoying my time greatly. Um, my friends are all excited because the sound of music was shot in Salzburg, but it seems <laughs> no one cares but me. So <laughs> um, I have been singing to myself this whole time, but uh, maybe other people, <laughs> not, not so important uh, American movies. Um, you can find me on the internet, uh, various places. Uh, my name, as we say in English, is Rhein Wine. Um, very, very pretty sounding. Uh, I used to live in Bonn, so that is where my name comes from. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about containerization and what even is it because people are kind of slinging this word around and maybe not using it correctly or maybe having multiple meanings for it. I'm going to hopefully clear that up for you a little bit. Um, and then we'll get into actually using containers in your project. Um, you might have heard of containerization or containers before and if you have, you've probably heard about them in context of this giant blue whale um, called Docker. Um, one thing I want to clear up before we get started is that Docker is not a container. Docker does not equal containers. Um, Docker is a tool. Containers are the thing that will actually manipulate. Um, so Docker does two things. It um, manages the code that goes inside of them, and then it also executes and runs the code inside of them. So there's kind of the management and execution part to Docker, but again, it is a tool. It's not a container itself. Um, so before we actually talk about Docker and how you might use it, let's understand what containers are first, and then we can integrate them into some of our projects. Um, so a container is a virtualization layer. A container is kind of like a virtual machine. Um, it's a self-contained execution environment. So if you think about um, a server in terms of physicality, it's probably maybe a big data center. It could be a laptop like this one. Um, but there's some physical hardware, though. Um, and then on top of that is a virtual layer, so not a physical layer, and that's where containers live. Um, a container, much like a virtual machine, can share the kernel of the host system it's on. Um, it's isolated from other containers. So if you have something running in one container, it can't touch stuff going on in another container unless you explicitly give it permission. Um, and another great thing about containers, which we'll talk about a little bit more, is that they have very fast boot times and very low overhead. So you could say that they're very cheap in terms of time and space. Um, and containers can work in conjunction or in place of traditional virtual machines that you might already use in your project. For example, if you use uh, Rails, you might have your Rails application running on one virtual machine and your database running in a different virtual machine. You can replace virtual machine with container. You might have one virtual machine running two containers. So they can work integrated with each other, or you can use one or the other. Um, and again, it is just a virtualization layer. People think containers are so scary because they're kind of low-level systems things, but I'm here to tell you and persuade you that they're not really that scary. They're not really that hard to use. They're kind of like a virtual machine. Um, however, they do have some fundamental differences, which many people find uh, super appealing, and that's a big reason why we use containers. So let's look at actually physically and virtually what these differences are. Um, so this is a kind of schematic diagram of what a traditional application that has a web component and a database might look like if it's um, on a virtual machine. Uh, so we have hardware, which is maybe a data center, and then the host OS on that hardware, and a hypervisor, which is managing and allocating resources for our virtual machine. And these light blue blobs at the top, if you can imagine each column as a separate virtual machine, you'll see we have three of them running. Um, and then the two labeled web, that's our web application, so we could say that's Rails. Um, we have two instances of those running, a little bit of redundancy. There's probably a load balancer somewhere, I just didn't put it on the slide. Um, and then over on the other side, we have our database running. And you notice each of these kind of has its own little stack and column. They have a guest OS and libraries, and no one is sharing um, or learning any of those and uh, using any of those things we learned in kindergarten about being, uh, being good friends with one another. Um, but if we introduce containers, we can actually get rid of a lot of the junk that virtual machines force us to have, um, namely the hypervisor and then the guest OS on each of the machines. So we'll get rid of that. And in its place, we can introduce something called a container runtime engine. So this is a level where Docker comes in. So the container runtime engine is basically your point of contact between um, you deploying your applications and then the kernel or the host system. Um, you notice on top we have still web, web, database, still three applications running separately in their own little 
containers. Um, but one big difference is that the libraries are shared now. So instead of having two duplicate copies of libraries needed for our web component, they can just share the same one. I think it's silly to use the same thing over again if it's just identical. So um, with Docker and with containers, you can give permissions to let um, processes that are isolated still share the same resources if you want them to. So that's what's happening here. Um, and of course, this is not to scale. In fact, this uh, environment will boot up in uh, probably a very small fraction of the time if you're using traditional, traditional virtual machines. Um, so one of the drawbacks and maybe some criticisms of containers is that they are slightly more complex. Um, that little diagram doesn't come for free. There's some tooling and orchestration around it, but it does reduce the amount of time and space that you need to run the same application in a container versus a virtual machine. Um, there's a couple big benefits of containerization. Um, really quickly, fast, cheap, because you're using less resources, it boots faster. Less resources means less money, means less people maintaining hardware, always great. Uh, portable is really exciting about containers. Um, you have a pretty um, standard kind of easy to duplicate testing environment. Everything that is in your container is run from one image. So if you run it on a production server, on your own laptop, in a development environment, it's all the same, it's gonna be the same all the time. You can give it to someone else in your organization. You can put it on GitHub. People can pull it down. It will be absolutely identical. Um, there's no manual configuration, really, um, as long as you can at least give instructions and automate some of the stuff in the, in the container. The last thing that's really great about containers is that they are safe. Um, the worst thing that will ever happen, because the containers are so isolated, um, in terms of networking, in terms of processes, if something goes terribly wrong, the worst thing you'll have to do is reboot your container. It will not hose your entire environment. You will not have to reboot a virtual machine. You will not have to reboot your computer. You might just have to say, Docker, remove this thing, and boot it up again in a matter of milliseconds. So containers are super great, um, but it doesn't do us much good if we can't practically use them in an application. Um, in order to do this, of course, we need to install Docker. Um, there are other things you can use. There's Linux containers, there's Rocket. Docker, I, I prefer because it wraps a nice front-end experience on this whole containerization process. Um, to install Docker, you need a couple things. Um, you need a computer, so that can be your laptop, that can be virtual um, something in a data center, et cetera. You need application code. So whatever application you're trying to run inside a container, that needs to be done, tested, and we'll package it up. I'll show you how to do that in just a second. Um, also, I find coffee is very helpful. This can be a little frustrating, and it might take a little bit longer than you might hope the first time, so grab some coffee. Um, all right, so a computer. You need a computer to put code on. Of course, this is something that we all know. Um, if you're using Linux already, super great. You can just install the official packages. You really don't have to do anything. Docker was first developed with Linux containers, LXC. Docker runs super natively on Linux. It's kind of meant, it's, kind of, it's, it's its home and it feels nice and warm and fuzzy on, in a Linux environment. So you can just download official packages and it's not a big problem at all. But if you're using anything else, um, specifically if you're using a Mac, you need to have some kind of virtual machine running. I know I just said virtual machines are gross and big and bloated, um, <laughs> but the point here is that you can run lots and lots, dozens of containers on one virtual machine versus running one application, one virtual machi machine. So the density is much bigger. Having one VM on your laptop is not gonna totally ruin the performance and ruin your development experience. Um, Docker has this thing called boot to Docker, which is super easy. Um, it actually links all your folders and does some happy configuration for you behind the scenes, so it almost feels like you're using Docker natively. When I demo for you in just a bit, I'm gonna be using boot to Docker. Don't be fooled, I'm not using Docker on my Mac. I am actually using a virtual machine, it's running Linux. Um, it looks like I'm using it on my Mac, but totally not, so don't be fooled. Um, so installing Docker is, um, you know, it might take you a little bit, but once you have it up and running, you can um, use Docker for two things. Again, you can use it to manage code um, to go inside of your container, and then once we have kind of the application code packaged up or managed, then we can think about running the application code. So the first thing to know about containers is that every container is based on an image. If you think of an image as the class in a container as an instantiation of that class, that's a good analogy to kind of help yourself understand the relationship between image and container. You can't have a container unless you have an image. 
the application code that you're going to run needs to be packaged into an image in order to be run inside of a container. Just like you would package it up to deploy it inside a virtual machine, kind of the same, the same process here. Um, every image is controlled by a thing called a Docker file. Um, a Docker file is just a set of instructions that tells Docker how to package your code for you. Um, there's two ways that you can get these images. One is actually, um, you don't have to interact with the Docker file directly. You'll interact with something called the Docker Hub, which is basically like GitHub for Docker images. So you can interact with it, push pull, Docker pull, Docker push, et cetera, um, kind of just like you would with GitHub. It's very similar feeling. Um, additionally, one tip, if you just want to skip the pull, if you do, do Docker run, Docker will try to find the image that you're trying to run on the hub first. And if it can't find it, it will tell you. So you could simply say Docker run Rails. It will go to the public hub, try to find the image, pull it down, and run it in a container for you. Um, you can additionally build it from your own Docker file. You can say docker build uh, dash t for tag. Foo bar, that's the name of the image. Foo would be my GitHub username, and then bar would be the name of my image. And then the directory that has the Docker file, usually it's the one that you're in, so you just say period. So Docker has this thing called a registry, which is what we're calling Docker Hub, Docker Registry, kind of they're used interchangeably. That's where images live, and you can pull them down and interact with them directly. You can also build your own images. Um, and in fact, the hub and the community part is what people love about Docker so much. Um, it gets a gold star. Uh, people love it because you don't have to write your own code if you don't feel like it. If you want to run WordPress and Postgres together, you can just pull them down, get them to talk to each other. You don't have to code anything. Um, it's a really easy way to get started with Docker, especially if you're using boot to Docker. Um, and this is what the registry looks like. It's actually pretty similar to GitHub. You can integrate GitHub and your Docker Hub account. Notice that these official repositories are there. So this is what I'm saying when you don't have to code at all. If you just want to pull down Mongo to use in your project, just say Docker run Mongo. I, hey, boo. Um, <laughs> you can just use it. You don't have to do anything. You can pull down Node. All of these things are already pre-managed, pre-made into images for you. You don't have to do anything. Um, so it's a really nice, easy way to use containerized components within your application. Um, so again, this is the public registry. Um, you'll find two types of images. Services is kind of what we have seen, Node, um, Mongo, these are services that are prepackaged. Um, be careful to look out for these um, project-based images. These are meant for active development, um, which we're not really going to talk about today. I'm happy to talk about it afterward, but it's a little bit more in-depth, um, and I figured we'd just cover the basics to get you up and running with Docker today. Um, there are two different kinds, so just make sure you're pulling down one that's already ready for you to, to run in a container. It will say so in the documentation. Um, and again, those are official images. They are maintained by other people. So if you are lazy like I am, it is great. Um, I cannot tell you how wonderful it is to not have to worry about a MySQL dependency. I can just pull it down directly. Um, most of these repositories have excellent documentation. So if you want to bootstrap something, um, it has instructions for bootstrapping already in the documentation. Um, and again, they can be base images, which are images that you'll use actively in development or actually run services. That's kind of what we're looking for when we're first starting out. We want things that are going to just, you know, we can say Docker run, and our service is going to start. Um, additionally, if you work at a company, uh, I used to work for HP. We had a lot of locks on our code. We didn't want people to see it. Um, you can have a private registry. Um, just know that this is another option for you. You don't have to rely on the Docker public hub. You can also host one yourself if you have kind of a proprietary information, or if you just don't want to expose your learning curve to the world, sometimes we don't want to do that. Um, you can find instructions for running your own Docker registry on the public Docker registry. So you can pull down a registry from the registry to run your registry, um, which is really straightforward and probably really simple, right? So um, again, the registry is the basis. Uh, that's where your images are managed, so either publicly or privately. You can pull down images that are pre-made and inter interact with it just like the Docker Hub. Um, it's great because you don't have to write your own code. Here's a little visual example of what it might look like to run an application where you pull things down from the Docker Public Hub. Um, I can say Docker run WordPress and Docker run MySQL. I do some magic, which I'll get to later, to get WordPress to know that it has a dependency. And suddenly, I have a WordPress installation, and I didn't have to write anything. These are running, again, um, either on a virtual machine, like boot to Docker, 
um, or any other CoreOS, Linux. Um, there's a few other operating systems that support Docker. This could just be running um, on your own Linux, like bare metal uh, server, if you, if you have that. Um, additionally, you can also package your own code and run them in containers. So all of that, um, the example before was pulling it down from the Docker Hub. Right now I'm gonna show you the way that if you have your own Rails application, you have your own Rails, or application that you wanna run in a container, you can build that image instead of pulling it down um, and then run it on your own system or distribute it somewhere else to be run. Um, and that's just one extra step. Instead of just saying Docker run, we're gonna Docker build um, T for tag, my image, the image name, and a period. Um, then we'll run it, again, with a little bit of magic, um, link it magically to our, to our database, and then run that as well. Um, so this is the same exact uh, architecture and the same kind of setup as before when we were pulling it down directly from the public hub, except in this example, we've built the image ourselves. So this is actually taking code from our own computer when it's ready for packaging and ready kind of for the world to consume. You can package it up into an image and then run the container again from that image. Um, so let's remember that images are built, for Docker, uh, built from Docker files. Um, really quickly before we build our image together, and I'm gonna do a little bit of live coding, which is definitely not stressful at all. Um, I just wanna show you and explain to you a little bit about um, what you might see in a Docker file. I'll admit that Docker does come kind of with a pretty steep learning curve, and I'm sorry if this talk seems very front-loaded with me babbling to you before I get to the good demo part, but I feel like I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't cover these kind of important bits and just let you loose to <laughs> wreak havoc on containers. It wouldn't really end happily for either of us, I don't think, so. Um, this is a Docker file, this is a very short one. This runs a Sinatra application. Um, there's a couple parts in here. Um, again, the, it's run top to bottom, um, not choose your own adventure. So um, thanks, Ramon, for that tip. Uh, from is a base image, so in this case, I'm basing it on a, a Ruby image. Um, CenturyLink is what, what I work for. I work for CenturyLink Lab. So we've made a bunch of these base images. Um, we have a couple Ruby ones, so you can just pick and choose whatever Ruby you want. Um, the next bits are the important parts. So I'm running a command with run. Uh, I'm gonna make a directory, and then with add, ooh, sorry. Um, then with add, I'm gonna add everything from the directory I'm currently in into the directory that I just made. So I'm taking code from my computer and putting it inside the image that will later go in a container. This is sort of how things get moved from your local environment into a container eventually. Um, note this is static. Once I do this, I can't change the code. This is not great for development. It's great for deployment, though, um, and also for dependencies. So from there, now that I have my code, I'm gonna run a bundle install. Um, working directory just sets uh, the context. It says, hey, run bundle install in this directory that I just put my Docker, or my, uh, gem file in. So I'll run a bundle install, and then I'm actually gonna start the container with this command ruby hello world.rb. Um, and that's it, this is pretty much the barest bones, simplest uh, Docker container. Um, I'm actually gonna run it for you right now, and hopefully it will demystify some of the um, concerns about, ooh, okay. Is that too, maybe too big? I think my aspect ratio is a little, little weird. Um, here. I want to, I, hopefully you guys in the back can still see, but. Um, so I, I'm gonna just check to see what Docker things I already have going on. Um, again, I'm using boot to Docker. This is totally not, um, this is not my Mac. This is a virtual machine. Um, sorry if this is kind of jumbled. I wanna make sure the people in the back can see. Um, you can see I have two images here created, hello world, and then there's one, the Ruby base. So um, the Ruby base we saw as our base image, that from command, and then hello world um, was from my previous build. Um, I can build it now again. Um, let's call it hello concat, and a period to signify that's exactly, um, I'm in the directory. So this is just gonna go th through um, right now, we're just in the bundle install step that we just saw. So this might take just a second to finish. Uh, okay, maybe more than just a second. 
<laughs> All right, we'll, um, here we go. Okay, cool. So we can see that it successfully built this um, image and it has this ID. Um, if I say Docker images again, I can see that I just created this image here. Um, and then to run, we'll say Docker run. Um, this is the magic I talked about. We have to do some port binding because of course we need to let it know that it's running on a port and we need to have some communication between the container and then the host port being the virtual machine. Um, I'm gonna choose 4567 and then I'm just gonna tell it the name of the image um, that I want to run in a container. I will press enter. You can see that Sinatra has started. Um, and then again, since I'm on a virtual machine, this is my host, uh, my Docker host for my boot to Docker machine. Um, oh. Oh, did I have a typo? Oh, for here. Thank you. Four, five. Okay. There we go. Okay, cool. So really that happened in like not even a second. I don't even think it took like a fraction. Of it. It's just so fast. So imagine how many times. It's so great because imagine how many times your environment, you do something dumb and like it breaks and you have to like restart everything. For me, that happens a lot because I make a lot of stupid mistakes, as you should. Um, so instead of having to take five minutes to restart my virtual machine, reconfigure everything, literally in less than a second, I could have my environment back up and running. So if anything, hopefully this will ease some pain in your development process. Um, so quickly, kind of just back to uh, a couple things. Um, so we saw how a container works. Again, the management part, deals with registries. Um, the execution part, let me just back up one. Um, executing and running code is the Docker CLI that you just saw me interact with. Um, just as a reminder, this is where Docker is living. Um, it's living kind of in between you and the hardware, so that is your point of contact. And in fact, you'll probably just interact with Docker from the CLI like you saw me doing. Um, there's really only a couple commands that you need to know to get started, um, Docker run, um, there's a couple flags like dash p, you saw my port binding. Um, there's environment variables that you can pass in. Um, you can docker pull, again, this is interacting with the registry. Docker images you saw me use, that's to list all of the images I have downloaded. And then finally, docker ps, which is all the processes that are running. Um, if this seems like a lot of work and typing on the command line is not your favorite thing, um, that's great because I work on an open source project um, that helps with application templating. So to conclude, I'm gonna kinda talk to you a little bit about the web um, interfaces and other tools you can use along with Docker if you're trying to kind of get started quickly or you just wanna poke around in the containerization world. Um, application templating is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. You can make a template for your application. You can specify all of your configura configuration options beforehand. And instead of having to run each container by itself, you just run your application, and it will automate all of the um, processes of starting up, configuring, port binding, environment variables, et cetera, of your containers for you, and you'll just end up with a nice, happy application. Um, there's a couple available for you. Um, Docker has one called Docker Compose. It used to be called Fig. Uh, they kind of bought Fig and absorbed it and turned it around, and now it's called Docker Compose, which is great, but I like Fig better because it um, is shorter. So it is text only. So if you're not super comfortable with the command line or super comfortable in YAML, maybe not a great first choice for you. Um, it does kind of work the same way uh, as other tools. You put everything in a YAML file and then you run your application with Docker Compose up. Um, you can check out it uh, on GitHub, uh, github.com slash docker slash compose. Has all the documentation and all that good stuff um, there for you. Um, lastly, Panamax is the tool that I work on. It's an open source project. It's a Ruby, Rails, Go, um, lots of JavaScript and Angular, lots of cool stuff. Um, if you feel like contributing to something, it's very fun. Um, and the core contributors I've heard are very lovely people. So um, it is very similar to Docker Compose. We did that on purpose. You can kind of go back and forth. If you start with Docker Compose and you want to switch to Panamax, or if you start on Panamax and you want to switch to Docker Compose, Totally fine, we made it to be pretty compatible. Um, the biggest thing is that it has a UI. So you can, instead of just typing everything, you can drag and drop and press buttons and kind of illustrate, uh, 
It'll illustrate for you the architecture of your application and you can manage it in a, in a much easier visual way. Um, it also supports remote deployments. If you want to deploy to Amazon or Google or whatever your digital ocean, whatever your choice is, you can actually deploy your containerized application directly to it just by pressing a button. Um, you don't have to do any, any magic other than just get a token. Um, you can check that out at panamax.io slash getpanamax. Um, here is a sample application. Um, you can see it's pretty standard YAML. We have some images. Um, we can specify links, some ports, um, description, et cetera. But do it once, and that's all you have to do. Um, quickly, this is what the UI looks like. So this search goes directly to the Docker public registry. You can also integrate it with private registries. So even if you have already a Docker workflow set up or you don't want to bother writing your own code, you can use Panamax to interact um, just directly with the Docker public registry. Um, and then you don't really have to type anything. You can kind of just click around and get a containerized application up and running pretty quickly. Um, lastly, some resources on your containerized journey. Um, I do have a tutorial up on my GitHub account. Um, it's just this Hello World container demo that I did for you. I have a couple different ways of implementing it. There's some different strategies and styles of working with containers. Um, there's a lot of documentation and all the source code is in that repository. Um, check out the Docker Hub. Again, boot to Docker is really great if you're just getting started. Um, Panamax, and then of course Rails Girls Summer of Code is super great and you should all consider donating or just tweeting and getting the word out so that more um, participants can be sponsored and work on cool open source projects. Um, that's all, I'll be here through the end of the day, so feel free to ask me any questions if you see me drinking coffee by myself. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you.